Good morning, Trinity. That was eh. Good morning, Trinity. That was better. We're thankful and grateful that we get to have the the ROM lectures. This is uh, the 40th, I believe. And uh, and we are blessed that uh, the family of Bernard Rahm uh, affords this for us each year to hear from someone who has uh, uh, expertise in the field of preaching and homiletics. This year, of course, we have Dr. Matthew Kim, who is the Associate Professor of Preaching and Ministry at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. And he will be sharing a word with us today. He has served as a pastor, a noble task, uh, and uh, no doubt that brings shaping influences into his teaching and his writing, uh, which is growing rapidly in its prolificacy, which is great. Um, he's co-edited, I don't think this is listed in his uh, bio there, but he's co-edited Hermeneutics and Homiletics. It's a short uh, four views book on preaching, and I commend that to you. Uh, Preaching as it relates to biblical interpretation, important issues being unpacked there. And coming soon, I think uh, a massive tome, (laughs) uh, the big idea companion to preaching and teaching, which will be released by Baker. Uh, That's going to be uh, something that's going to be really helpful for preachers on their bookshelves. But for those of you who are not preachers, you don't plan on being a preacher uh, per se, Uh, We do want to be able to be effective communicators of our faith. And I think uh, what uh, Dr. Kim is helping us understand is to understand the listener as we communicate our faith. And I think a lot of it goes, spills beyond the pulpit and into counseling and discipleship and just friends over a cup of coffee, uh, conversations with friends over a cup of coffee. Uh, to communicate to others in ways that are winsome, effective, and intelligent. So would you join me in welcoming Dr. Matthew Kim. Thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, It's great to be back home in Chicago. I was born and raised uh, not too far from here uh, down the road in Palatine, so it's, it's great to be back home. Let me pray for us as we open up God's word together. Join me in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that as we have just sung, you are a faithful God. We thank you that even waking up this morning, we can testify to your goodnesses in our life, the kindness that you have shown to us, your mercy that is new every morning, and your faithfulness is not just here in this room, it expands beyond this country and to the ends of the earth. You are a faithful God. And so, Lord, as we come to your word now, I pray that you would help us to see new things in your your word, that we might be able to see who you are more clearly, that Jesus might become even more real to us today as a result of listening to your voice. Father, use me to be faithful to your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. May you receive all of the glory, honor, and praise, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. As I just shared, I was born and raised in Chicago, and I was the oldest of three boys, and in my family, I was the one who could not do math. Now, the stereotype exists that all Asians are good at math. And when you have a family of 70 extended family members that come over for Thanksgiving every, uh, every year to your parents' home in Palatine, and it's sprawling with cousins and aunts and uncles, and they're asking you uh, when you come back from college, so, Matt, what are you going to study? And in my family, we had... Um, Back then, a senior vice president for Motorola, a science genius, uh, accountants, mechanical engineers, people who were all good at math. And they looked at me and asked in front of everyone, so Matt, what are you going to major in for college? And I had decided on a history major. 
And I still remember the looks my family members gave me as I sheepishly said, history. They turned with a look of amazement and curiosity and disappointment. What are you going to do with that? Now, I want you to turn to your neighbor, and this is probably the most spiritual lesson you'll learn today. I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them, not all Asians are good at math. Go ahead. (laughs) Not all Asians are good at math. Not all Asians are good at math. Not all Asians are good at math. Now, I feel a lot better now. Anyone else not good at math in the room? All right. Praise God for you. Praise God for you. I love you. Thank you so much for admitting that. That's wonderful. So God has created all of us with different gifts, different talents, different interests. And for those of us uh, who may enjoy English and sociology and history, uh, eventually landing on that history major led me to a lot of reading, of course. And one of the books that I read for class was Utopia by Thomas More, written in the 1500s. And in this fictional tale of this perfect place, this utopia. He, he writes about how uh, there is a, a perfect place where people would come and you didn't have to lock the doors on your, on your house because you expected everyone to not steal from you and, and, and harm you. You didn't have to lock your car door. You, you could go to a, a bin, a storage warehouse where you can get all your food and you were expected not to steal or take too much. Uh, I'm sorry for any pre-law people, but there were no attorneys in this utopia because people knew the law. They understood how society would operate in a a moral society. And so this utopia is written about, and I got excited about that when I was reading it. But then I looked around around the world and I saw a non-utopic place, a place of fallenness, of sin, of brokenness, of weeping, of pain, of sin, of disconnection with the Lord. And it led me to uh, study more carefully this passage in Acts chapter 2. So I don't know if you have your Bible with you uh, or available, but let's turn to Acts chapter 2 and read about not just a, a, not a place that we would idealize as a, as a utopic place, but a place where God's people truly resembled what he art, uh, wanted it to be, a, a, a place of, of joy and encouragement, selflessness, a place where people really loved one another. So in Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 41, let me read for us. Those who accepted his message, which was Peter's message, were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. If you remember from Acts chapter 2, the promised Holy Spirit had come. Jesus promised in John chapter 14 that you would have, the disciples would have a comforter, someone who would walk alongside of us in the Christian life, that we weren't alone in the Christian life, that the Holy Spirit would come and infuse power and life-giving transformation for the disciples. As you know, in John's gospel, the disciples were concerned, Jesus, where are you going? How could you leave us? How could you abandon us? And Jesus reminds them, I'm going to send you Just wait. I'm going to send you my spirit. And your spirit, this Holy Spirit, will will be with you. And he's going to encourage you. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to help you persevere in the Christian life. That even if you face persecution for me, I will be with you. And this promised Holy Spirit would come. And so prior to this reading that we have just done, we see the work of the Holy Spirit. And Peter's message was one of conviction wanting the people to believe, repent for their sins, and trust in in this Jesus whom they had just persecuted and killed. And so it tells us earlier in this passage passage that the, the people were cut to the heart. They were 
transformed. And they repent. And about 3,000 believers put their faith in Christ that day. So what do you do when you had just a small group of disciples that now become 3,000 church members? Put yourself in the shoes of the disciples. What would you do if 3,000 people came crashing through these chapel doors and wanted to be a part of this new ministry, this new life in this person called Jesus Christ? What would you do with them? I'm so glad you asked. Let's take a look and see. Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The early church understood that apart from God's word, apart from fellowship, apart from prayer and worship, that the Christian life would have less meaning. It wouldn't be uh, viable for them to, to continue in a persecuted society, that these four elements would help them and enable them and equip them for the Christian life ahead. The first thing that the writer Luke reminds us of is that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to Jesus Christ, his life and ministry. They were devoted to reminding each other of his return. They were reminded of his teachings on moral living and ethical living. They were reminded of Old Testament passages that spoke of Christ. And all these teachings, they continue to remind each other. And I wonder, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, have we lost sight of the Word of God, the precious nature of what God has given us in His Word? And being at a Christian university, it's easy, I'm sure, to lose sight of the Gospel. It's it's easy to lose sight of how precious this book is. And it becomes uh, just another textbook. And the Apostles reminding us today, this Author Luke, who who knew the ministry of Christ so well, he reminds us of how important it was for the early church members and people today to be in the book, to be in the Word of God daily, to be teaching each other and encouraging each other with the Word of God. As a pastor in Colorado, I had an opportunity to go to China to do short-term missions. And one of the things that the host uh, had, had asked me to do was prepare a Bible study. And so I prepared um, a a study through the book of Nehemiah. I thought that if I got through 13 chapters of the Word of God, that would be plenty of material. And in my church in Colorado, where I was a pastor, if I taught for about 30 minutes uh, into a Bible study, people would start getting really tired and, you know, they'd get antsy. You know, and then you get to about 45 minutes, and then people are starting to raise their hand and saying, hey, Pastor Matt, do you mind if I go to the bathroom? And I say, yeah, sure, and then we never see them again. And this was the kind of atmosphere that I had been ministering in. And so when I got to China, I thought, you know, 13 chapters of Nehemiah, even if we spent 30 minutes on each chapter, that'd be plenty of material to work with. And so I taught, and I taught through Nehemiah's book, trying to encourage the young believers, these second-generation Christians in China, what it meant to be part of a community, how to build the community together And this this wall of Jerusalem and what that looks like for these people, these young Christians, to build um, their own community there in the midst of persecution. And so I taught through Nehemiah. And I remember uh, after about 45 minutes, I was starting to get a little antsy myself. Maybe it was the jet lag. And at about one hour, I, I raised my hand and I asked them, would you mind if I use the restroom? And they looked at me in unison and just said, Sit down. You've only just started. And for the next several days, eight hours a day, I went with them systematically as much as I could through the Bible. These young Christians were so hungry for the Word of God. They wouldn't even let me go to the bathroom. That's how much they loved the Word of God. I wonder if we've lost sight. It's so easy. It's so easy to be in an age of comfort that the first thing I want to do is just rest because I'm so tired. And yes, life is hard. The Christian life is challenging. You're working. You're studying. You're, you're trying to meet so many demands. There are so many things vying for your attention. And yet, God is reminding us today of how important this book is, that the Word of God is to be valued and treasured. Not only that, it teaches us that they were to be involved in fellowship 
And scholars debate whether it was two, really two things. It was just the apostles' teaching and fellowship and that the breaking of bread and prayer were um, part of that fellowship. But when you think of fellowship, what is the first thing that might come to your mind with that word, fellowship? Any ideas? Well, yeah, eating, thank you. I was thinking of food, right? So when you have fellowship, you often have food together. And in my church in Colorado, we would, um, a smaller congregation, every week someone would bring food for the entire church, and we would eat together and spend time together in that way, just sharing life together. But not only that, it tells us here that they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. This was probably a meal with uh, communion following, that the Lord's table would be celebrated after their shared meal together. And then finally, to, to prayer. And as you think about your own church context where you worship on Sunday, is your church devoted? Is there allegiance? Is there time well spent in these four dimensions of the Christian life? I wonder if we focus less on programs and the latest fads and devoted ourselves to these four things that the early church held so dear, I wonder if there would be transformation and excitement and new life in our churches today. Prayer is one of the hardest things that I do because my human nature does not want to pray. Maybe the same is for you as well. And if you don't mind me sharing just some stories about my life and not every sermon that I preach is about me, but as I was candidating for a church in, in, in California, I still remember being, uh, waiting for my uh, ride to pick me up and I was standing on the curb at the church and, and an associate pastor was looking at me and he wasn't just looking at me, he was uh, really making me feel uncomfortable as he put his arms uh, across his chest and looked me up and down. And I felt very, very insecure in this moment. And then he asked me, so Matt, how many hours a day do you pray? I was so angry in that moment because I thought, who, who, who is this person? How dare they ask me how many hours a day that I pray when in fact I was thinking, I don't pray in terms of hours. I think in terms of minutes. And it wasn't this pastor that was asking me, how much do you pray? I felt God's presence asking me, look, you want to be a pastor of a church, but how connected are you to me? Is your life full of prayer? Are you praying ceaselessly? Are you constantly in fellowship with me? And so these early church members understood the power that comes from prayer. And again, this is countercultural. People don't want to pray today. People don't want to go to prayer meetings at church. It's one of the least attended things in our congregations today is that thing called the prayer meeting. And yet, the early church understood. They understood the, the importance of these four truths. So as they devoted themselves, we see what happened, the, the response, starting in verse 43 of what was happening as they devoted themselves to these four elements. Look with me to verse 43. It says, Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of this church. Anybody? Am I the only one? Anybody want to be a part of this church? Why? Why would you want to be a part of this church? Because you come through the doors at church, and oftentimes in, in North American churches, at least for, from my experience, uh, people are not very friendly. You may not even get greeted. You may get a, a, a handshake, oh, welcome to service. But there's no real community. There's no life happening. People don't really ask you about your lives. They expect you to say, yeah, of course, I'm doing fine. How are you? Yeah, good, fine, thanks. They don't really want to know. And this early church had a completely different philosophy of life and ministry as disciples. They knew that there were broken people on the margins, the poor, the needy, those who still needed Christ in their lives. And yet, what does the teaching tell us? It tells us, that they were absolutely not selfish, but selfless. If you say the word selfish, you, ha you have to automatically smile. Did you know that? 
Well, try that with me. Selfish. Selfish. You actually have to smile to say the word selfish. But when you say the word selfless, your mouth goes down. And that's how in society we operate. When we think of ourselves and what I need and what I want to be uh, doing in this life, and I get excited about my own life, I get selfish, and I think, yes, that's what God has created me for, to, to, to meet my needs. But the early church was countercultural again. That in an age where they could have been selfish, they were selfless. Rosario Butterfield, in her book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key, has really wrecked my life. Because I've always enjoyed Christian comfort and growing up in a Christian home and uh, wanting to have, uh, you know, just following that American dream that everybody talks about, even as a pastor, and thinking, yeah, I don't want to really be too uncomfortable with my life. I don't want to serve beyond my means. I just want to be comfortable. And Butterfield's book said, no. If you profess the gospel, everything that God has given you is the community's. It belongs to God. It's not yours. And so I, as I've been praying about the Christian life and my own deficiencies and my own inadequacy in terms of living out a selfless Christian life, this, this book reminds me, the gospel comes with a house key, that your house is not your own. Your possessions are not your own. Your income is not your own. Your books are not your own. Your clothes are not your own. Nothing is your own. And it wrecked me because I'm selfish by nature. And that's what the early church did. They, they saw the need. It doesn't tell us that they sold everything. It says when they saw people in need, they sold what they had in order to feed and care for those who had need. I shared in the lecture uh, yesterday morning that uh, my younger brother um, was murdered brutally in the Philippines uh, four years ago. And this episode of this event has really uh, wrecked my family in terms of our own, it's shaken up our faith. And at the age of, of 36, having his life taken from him uh, at such a young age, and uh, my brother was exceedingly more gifted than me. He was a member of Mensa. He was a bright guy. He, he was a Renaissance person. He, he had so many gifts from God, and I still wonder, and I still ask the Lord, why him, Lord? And I know that he has a sovereign plan for his life. But if anyone has modeled Acts 2 for me, beyond a book or any other person, it was my brother Tim. My brother Tim would wear the same shoes for years. They would have holes in them sometimes. And every time I came home from college, I'd say, Tim, why don't you pick up a pair of shoes? He'd say, no, no, someone else needs my money more. And every time my parents gave me money as the oldest, I would always give my brothers a third of what I got. So oftentimes, you know, I'd come home from college and my parents would give me like 300 bucks and say, this is just to help you out. And I'd take 100 and I'd give it to Tim and I'd take 100 and I'd give it to Dennis, my youngest brother. And I always knew that the money I gave to Tim, Tim would never spend on himself. He would always use it to care for the least of these. He had a cell phone business in downtown Chicago at the age of 23. And he, he wanted to make a, a difference. And back then, it was probably the um, early 2000s. Cell phones were a big deal. And, and he, he thought this was the, the way to make some money. And what he would do during his lunch hour is that he would take time off from his lunch uh, and, and just... Uh, shut down the shop and, and walk around downtown Chicago and just hand out sandwiches telling them that Jesus loved them. That was the kind of selfless heart that I think is what this passage is referring to, this absolute abandonment of what this world offers and what this world promises for a new kind of Christian life. A life where people really valued Christ-like living, sacrificial giving, what God is calling each and every one of us to do, to rise out of our comfort zones and say, I'm going to live a life completely and utterly given to Christ, that nothing belongs to me, everything belongs to him, and I just want to use my life fully for his glory. Do you believe that, dear brothers and sisters in Christ? God wants to do a remarkable work in you today. 
Not when you graduate. He wants to do it today in your lives, in your churches, in your families. God wants to create an entirely different world through us, through you. If we would only have the courage, if we would only have the courage. And so as as each person was given what they needed, it says here in verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And what was the transformation that was happening? It says, every day the Lord added believers. Every day people were coming to Christ. Every day people's lives were transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every day. And oh, how I wish that that was representative of my life. That every day I would live and walk in such a way that I would be completely selfless like Christ and be able to bring people into the kingdom because of the good news of Jesus Christ and because of our testimony lived out in good works. That is the kind of church I want to be a part of. And I think it's the kind of church that you want to be a part of as well. As I think about selflessness, uh, the thing that is attractive about selflessness is that it's contagious. You just need one person who is selfish to ruin the ethos of a church or a classroom. But when you have a selfless person, it changes the entire atmosphere of a room. It changes the entire culture, the way the things that people, the way things are spoken about, and how people relate to each other. When when people are selfless, there's something attract, attractive about that. We want to be near selfless people. And I remember having a conversation at my church with one of our our church members who was a physician, and he he knowing that I had two young kids at the time who were uh, 17 months apart, they were always getting sick. Uh, sometimes my, my wife wouldn't be able to go to church because the kids were always sick. And so he would say to me, Matt, I, don't, I know you don't really want this, but I'm going to give you some parenting advice today. I said, okay, yeah, sure, no problem. And so we were, we were just talking, and he looked over at me and he said, do you know what I, do when I, what I did when my kids were young? I said, no, I don't know what you did. He said, well, whenever my kids were sick, or well, at least one of them was sick, I would take the spoon, from the, and, and one spoon, and take, put it into the, Uh, mouth of the kid who was sick and then I would immediately take it out and I put it into the mouth of the other kid who was not sick. I thought, you're such a cruel dad. Uh, You're a physician. Don't you want to eliminate illness? Why would you want to perpetuate illness? And I'm I'm thinking this in my head. I would never say that to his face. Uh, So he's telling me this uh, parenting strategy, put the spoon in this person's mouth and take it out and then put it into this kid and then, you know, however many kids you have. And I thought, why would you do that? And and so I asked him, so why did you do that? And he said, I promise you, whether it's one day, five days, three weeks, or a month later, the other kid always gets sick. So why would I prolong my suffering? Get it over with right now. Boom, boom, we're done. Maybe in a few days, everybody will be healthy. But there's something about being contagious is that it always infects other people. The selfless Christian life that God is calling not just the early church to, but us today as believers in Christ. If you would be so bold, and I would be so bold, just one person, yes, you and me, we can change the world for Christ. We can change this community for Christ. It takes boldness, it takes commitment, it takes reminding ourselves of the faithfulness of God. That when I am selfless and I deplete myself of everything that I am for the sake of Jesus, God will take care of us. God will care for us, he'll take care of our needs. And as we present the gospel to people, we don't just present the good news, of course we do that clearly and effectively, and we want people to know that Jesus lived a perfect life, that he, that he died that he rose again, that he is coming back. We present the gospel to them clearly of the sin that needs to be forgiven, the broken relationship between us and God that needs to be mended. 
but we also do it with our lives. Dear Trinity, I pray for you that even one person today in this chapel would be so countercultural that you would be able to exemplify for the world what this looks like to be a selfless Christian. Because if we boil it down, these four aspects of learning, fellowship, caring for each other, and worship, as one scholar has succinctly put it, it tells us that Christian community is contagious when it's selfless. Will you say that with me? Christian community is contagious when it's selfless. Dear church, dear, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I pray for you that you will take up God's call. And even today, as you walk through these doors, that your life and testimony would look more like this passage. You're not going to remember me. You're not going to remember my name. But I want you to remember what God has told us today. Christian community is contagious when it's selfless. Will you pray with me? Father, we come before you today and recognize that there are many um, burdens that we bear in the Christian life. And maybe for some of us, this passage is another burdensome passage where we feel overwhelmed by the, the desires that you have for Christians. Lord, I confess, God, that it's hard. It's hard to be a Christian. It's hard to live counterculturally from the, the rest of this world and what they value. Father, I pray for my dear brothers and sisters in Christ here at Trinity that you would help each one of us to be reminded of what's most important in the Christian life, that you would help us, even through this passage, to reorient our own priorities. Because ultimately, all that matters is your kingdom, bringing people to your kingdom, being disciples and making disciples. It's not our name that needs to be exalted here on this earth. It's the name of Jesus Christ. And as each one of us do our part to live out the Christian life, I pray, God, that you would embolden us with the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would provide for us opportunities to be selfless and to have the courage to demonstrate that, even at a young age, to be a model for our, our Christian communities and our neighborhoods. Father, we thank you for the reminder of this word. Be exalted, O Christ, in our lives, for we, all we want to do is love you and spread your name to the ends of this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much.